Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Harrison Goodman. I'm the content executive here at Higher Things, and we have a brand new guest with us today. We have Dr. Sarah Zillinger. How are you today, doctor? Uh, I'm good. I'm enjoying my fall break at home, and I'm honestly a little nervous. I don't usually get people recording things that I'm doing, so... This will be fun. So um, Dr. Zillinger is a, um, a school psychologist. Uh, you've seen some stuff out there. It's, it's I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it's scary out there for our kids. Um, one of the things we get to do here uh, on the Drive to School podcast is we're just going to tackle the thing. Um, we talked a little bit before the, the show started about what we wanted to sort of focus in on today. And what we just, we can't escape is that we live in a culture of death. What do you see out there? Absolutely, Pastor. I, and I've put a lot of time thinking, um, just thinking about what is it, because I see a lot. And as part of my job as a school psychologist, I am the one who talks to kids about really hard topics. I'm the one who talks to kids when a loved family member has died, whether it's a grandma or a grandpa, a family pet, um, or a parent, or I'm sorry to say it, but sometimes it's a friend. Um, sometimes it's one of their classmates, whether they've died from illness or whether they have attempted to take their own life through suicide. It's just, it's a hard thing. And I see a, a lot of stuff out there. Um, and I think I get asked the question a lot of times, what is it with kids? Why are kids talking about suicide all the time? And you know, it's all these, the, the well-meaning grandmas, my own included, who I love dearly. They're like, well, what are kids talking about? Why do they, why do they go to death? We never used to do that. And I'm thinking, well, what's changed in our culture over the last oh, 40, 50 years? What makes kids today different from even like Pastor, when you and I were kids, more or less when our grandmas and grandpas or our parents were kids. And something that um, kind of struck me, and I like to think it's maybe the Holy Spirit, but that we really are living in a culture of death. For example, when I was a little kid, um, the worst thing in a haunted house was a bowl of cold spaghetti that they put your hand in and be like, ew, it's somebody's brains. And um, but now we are surrounded, certainly now it's October, right? You can't escape Halloween. It is every channel, cable, regular television. It is all over all of our media feeds. In fact, I can't drive down my street or walk through a shopping center without being surrounded by images of death. The, the skeletons, the gore, um, there are some incredibly popular series out there that honestly celebrate death. So that's part of it. So then I'm like, okay, well, really somehow in the last 40 years, our American culture has changed to celebrating death and to the point where um, Christians are kind of finding themselves right back like those Old Testament Israelites where people are sacrificing their own children. And, and I know that's a hard topic and it can be a really hot button topic, but I look back and, well, when abortion was legalized in the 1970s, maybe that was the change. Maybe all of a sudden we started thinking more about death than more about life. And now we've got a generation of kids who are being raised in this culture. And it's not just Halloween. It's not just this time of year. It is all times of year. Um, but when you look at the number of like skulls or skeletons on decoration like clothing backpacks um i'm pretty sure our listeners could name easily probably faster than me in fact because i am not focused on brand names or anything but they can name probably 18 name brands that have that that skull image and so we, we just can't escape it it's it's out there it, it, in a lot of ways, I, I mean, we can sort of play which came first, the chicken or the egg. But um, I, I think one of the things we can recognize, though, is that it, it comes with, it, well, despair. Um, it, it's, I think, the the emotion that's underneath, as much as we try and laugh about it and make jokes, as much as we, we have sort of focused on it, there is such a hopelessness to life in so many ways that it creeps over that if death is always sort of looming, it's almost treated as, as an escape and not an escape to be with something good, like like our Lord, uh, who has conquered death, but an escape to be away from something painful. Um, right. And if you spend all of your time running, it just gets, it gets exhausting. It is. And that's actually a coping mechanism for a lot of people. We joke about, about things that make us uncomfortable. And I'm just as guilty of that as 
uh, the next person. But I think there, there's a lot of validity to that. And so I think that one of the questions is like, okay, like you said, we have a Lord who has overcome death. He has conquered death through his blood and his death on the cross and resurrection. So how do I live as a person of life amidst this culture of death and despair? And, you know, we're not the first ones to think of this, of course, pastor, I think back to old Testament and, um, that I remember as a child getting into oh, the where it talks about vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. And I, in my nine-year-old mind, I was going vanity. Well, that means you're self-centered. And I started, I went to uh, probably my mom and asked about, it. she's like, well, really, it just means useless. Everything is useless. You build something, it's going to fall down. You uh, raise a child, you know, they're going to die someday. So it's kind of this inescapable factor of this world that we're, we're living in a sinful world. And um, I, that's very true. And some people do land in despair with that. Um, in fact, probably most of our world does land in despair. So for, for me, I know what I get to do uh, every Sunday. We, we stand up and we preach hope um, because despair for us is spiritually, it's met with the promises of the gospel that Christ was crucified to conquer death and not only death, but, but all of the things that bring it about, the sins uh, that, that you have committed, the sins that have been committed against you. Uh, and, and that's great. And I can say your sins are forgiven on the last day you will rise in your body. Be not afraid of death. You don't need to joke about it because you don't know how to make friends with it. You don't need to spend all of your time running from it or even leaning into it because you can't escape the things of this world. You have already been crucified, already been raised, and you have life. But after Monday rolls around, you still have to go back to school. You still have to deal with all of this stuff. What are what are some of the places uh, that, that we can look to for a little bit of hope in, in, in the mental health world? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I love that you talked about we don't have to make friends with death because we truly don't. It is not, I mean, it's our enemy, but it's like a vanquished enemy. It's right. that one that we step over every single day, multiple times to the point where, um, I don't know if you've ever like left something messy on the floor, like your laundry, maybe. Never, ever. And <laughs> not at my house either. And um, pretty soon you just get so used to walking it over. Pretty soon you're stepping over it even in the dark. And that's what death is for us as Christians. And it can get wearing though. We get tired. And so um, my first thing, and I'm sitting here with one of my, my favorite Bibles because it's got like room to journal on the sides. And it's starting, um, it was newer, but it's starting to look a little more used. But the words of Christ, those promises of Jesus are first and foremost, the thing that cannot be taken away from us. Um, are, there's stories uh, and history about prisoners in horrible prisoner of war camps, whether they're concentration camps or other things, that that was the thing, that was their hope, was they had memorized those promises of Jesus. And so I encourage everyone, write them down whether you photocopy it or like copy and paste it off the internet, when you find a verse that gives you hope, make it yours, make it your, your own promise, print it out, put it on a fun background, um, stick it to your bathroom mirror, stick it to the, um, on a sticky note, like the dashboard of your car, um, wear it around your neck. If you can find some jewelry or something, but that is, that can be first and foremost, the thing it can't take away. But then there's other things too, like surrounding ourselves with like-minded people. Um, I encourage fellowship and the spirit of God speaks to us through his word and through his people. And so find a church, find a church where um, you can get hooked in with a pastor, with a youth group, with that mentor who's maybe gone through this before and, and stay connected with them because there's a, a lot of hope in just being with those people. They don't have all the answers. Heck, I don't claim to have all the answers. And I joke that having a doctorate simply means um, you don't, you know how much you don't know. You really know you don't have any answers. And um, that's just something that, you, but I can walk with people. I can be with people. And sometimes if the despair gets to be too much or overwhelming, find those people, your school mental health person, if you happen to go to a school like that, um, if you are blessed to go to a Christian school, your theology teacher, there's, there's somebody. And we talk a lot at my school about trusted adults. Um, a trusted adult as a person who you could go to if you had a problem. 
somebody you could share something with and you know they're going to listen and that they have your best interests at heart. And I just take a minute, he were on the drive to school. And of course, I always hope that, you know, kids would say their parents or their trusted adults, but that's not always the case. But I, it's my sincere hope that everybody has somebody they trust. And even, even us, right. I'm supposed to be the grown up. Um, I, who are my trusted, who are my trusted people that I can go to for encouragement? Who are the ones that if I text and go rough day coming up and need prayers, who are the ones who are, are right on it? And you know are gonna hold you in prayer and hold you before the throne of God, regardless. So those are just a couple things. Yeah, and it's important to recognize too. Um, this doesn't mean that you'll escape the fear or the temptation or the pain or the suffering or the loneliness. Uh, but but death is sort of that that embrace of loneliness that is met by fellowship, and that doesn't vanquish the problem. But it, it's where Christ is at work to carry you through it. We we sort of have this idea that if you just go to church enough, everything bad will go away, and bad things will fall <laughs> into church. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> the church is just, it's a box full of sinners. The only thing that sets it apart is this is where Christ's promises are preached to you. So when, when we gather, it, it's not simply so we can like escape from the problems or, or sort of build a, a sanctuary that, that is apart from them. But, but rather, if we have to be in this veil of tears, we want to be first and foremost near our Lord. And then second, towards the people who will continue to point us to him because all of us stumble in the dark. But Christ right. is the light of the world and the light has been set on the hill that the darkness would not overcome it. And that is such a great promise to cling to, Pastor. And I, we joke in our church about there's nothing special about us other than um, we are redeemed by Jesus. And we are the ones who do life together. And life is messy. Life is hard. Life is scary. And those are the people who come alongside you be like, yep, been there, done that, still doing it. And we're going to do life together. And um it feels, it just, we joke about misery loves company. Um, to some degree, that is true, but I think hope also loves company. And it doesn't make the problems any less or any less serious, but it sure helps to have somebody who's willing to come up and link arms with you and go, um, this is a hard thing. I'm here for you. I'm going to sit with you. Um, let me hold hope for you for a little while until we get through this rough patch. Yeah, absolutely. So we have to live in a world where death is going to be the last great enemy until Christ comes again. But that doesn't mean that we have to be afraid of it. And it also doesn't mean that we need to embrace it as if there's there, there's no hope. But but rather, as we confront this, we, we look to it as, as already defeated in Christ. And, and so spiritually, we find our hope in the word and the sacraments. But but as we, we struggle, even just with mental health, you're not alone. You, you have people you can talk to. Is there any other advice? Oh, in terms of mental health, um, I think I equated it. I was talking to a young person recently um, who's really struggling a lot with depression and anxiety. And she looks at me, she said, I'm broken. I'm broken and I don't know. I'm like, I know we're all broken. And right now you're really feeling broken. And um, we talked about it being kind of like mental health. Think of it like the battery on your phone. Um, when it's fully charged and all of the operating systems are updated, your phone runs great. Um, and then we, I promise you, everybody listening is keeping an eye on their phone battery at some point. And right now, this young person's phone battery, their, their emotional health and mental health battery was flat out zero. It was a black screen, couldn't even turn on. And so getting this young person plugged in to some therapy, um, some, and sometimes that means intense therapy. Sometimes that means for some people, a hospital stay, which can sound scary, um, that, but that's probably another topic of what, what happens in the mental hospital. It's, it's not shock treatment and white coats anymore. It's a chance to, to recharge that battery. But sometimes when you're that low, even when you plug your phone in, it still doesn't turn on. It's still that black screen with just the little charger symbol sure. for quite a while. And gradually, as we get to know our phone, we're like, oh, I've been FaceTiming a lot. That's going to run my battery down a lot faster. And oh, my low battery warning just came on. As we get to know our own mental health and hopefully surround ourselves with people who know us and love us and who are honest with us about, hey, I know you're running, you're, you're, run, you're burning the candle at both ends. You're running too much. You've got to back off. And take some time. And then we figure out things that we can do to recharge, whether it's um, 
a retreat in the mountains, whether it's um, staying home instead of going to the party or the event or the haunted house, whether it's um, saying, you know what, I'm not going to watch that horror movie because that that's just going to freak me out. It's too much. So pretty soon as kids grow, and this, this is the hard thing about being a kid, right? It's like brand new phone. Um, because we don't know how long that battery takes to run down. We're figuring it out, but, um, asking people, calling people, there's great helpline numbers. If you, if you don't feel like you have somebody out there, but I will tell you, pastor, sometimes the hardest thing is, um, when you are feeling low and your battery's low, your mental health is low, reaching out is incredibly difficult. That is one of the hardest things to do. And it's also hard to tell the people you love the most. Um, but find the things that fill you up, whether it's spending time with someone, whether it's art, um, whether it's playing music or listening to music, being outdoors is a great way. And I'm even talking to you, people in Wisconsin and Michigan, put your boots and your coat on and go outside. Um, just being outside in God's creation is healing it is helpful and uh those kind of things sometimes we need to to follow the model of jesus when he was overwhelmed and and go away from the crowds for a while to pray and focus i feel like i'm rambling <laughs> so. no i think that's that's great that's a lot to kind of take in especially as we we confront this veil of tears but in all of it um we we might have to live in a culture of death but well life is we already do. risen from the grave so this right. is what we're going to hang on to in the middle of it. Uh, doctor, thanks so much for joining us today in the drive school. Uh, it was my pleasure. I hope to do it again someday. Thanks a lot, Pastor. Have a great day. You too.